Now, because this middle term gives itself the form of an outer expression, which is at the same time taken back into the inner, its existence is not restricted to the immediate organ of the action. The middle term is rather the movement and form of countenance and figure in general, which take no part in the action. These lineaments and their movements are, according to this notion, the action which is held back and which remains in the individual. And as regards the individual's relation to the action really performed, they constitute his own control and observation of the action, expression in the sense of a reflection on the actual expression. The individual is therefore not dumb as regards his external action because he is thereby at once reflected into himself and gives expression to this reflectedness into self. This theoretical action or the individual's speech with, it, with himself about the external action is also perceptible to others for this speech is itself an expression. In paragraph 317, Hegel is again talking about this middle term that is constituted by the, the organ, but in this paragraph, not fully so by it, as we're going to see, there's a very interesting dynamic that is going on within the individual. And, and you know, you, I've got this whole inner, outer, middle term as within the scope of the individual, but, but it's good that we remind ourselves that there's also this sort of estrangement that is occurring where what a person is expressing themselves through or by as the outer, to a certain extent, escapes them, the action or the speech that, that they, they let go into the world and which then can be interpreted or reinterpreted by an other. So Hegel begins here by saying this middle term it gives itself the form of an outer expression. We've seen that already, right? Which is not at the same time taken back, which is at the same time taken back into the inner. Um, that's what we're going to talk about through the rest of this paragraph. What does it mean for it to be taken back into the inner? How is this, this movement outward not simply a, a loss of itself or a um, constant flow, you might say, uh, of time, of effort, of attention, sort of exhausting what's inner and, and gradually culminating in there being only the outer. So what are the implications of this? He says, um, its existence is not restricted to the immediate organ of the action. What is the immediate organ of the action? Well, in, in the case of speech, we're talking about the mouth. Uh, we just talked in the previous paragraphs about other things like the hand, the handwriting, the voice itself. We, we might uh, expand this to other things as well. So he says, the middle term is rather, and here he's got kind of an interesting uh, formulation for this. The middle term is the movement, the bewegung, and the form of, as uh, Miller is translating it, the countenance. And what is the countenance? It is, it is the face. And the countenance is not just the face as something purely passive, something that doesn't, doesn't do anything, uh, as we might say in uh, a death mask. Rather, it is the countenance uh, as, as showing the person, as, as reflective of the inner. And then he says figure, um, gestalt. Right? Or the gestaltung, rather. Um, the, 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 the shape of the thing. Also, the way in which the parts are, are arranged in, in relation to each other. So this is uh, quite important here. And he, he goes on and he says, um, these don't actually take part in the action. And because they don't take part in the action, they're not getting lost in the action. They're remaining, you could say, with the, the individual. Um, they they you know, are going to transfer, uh, as we could say, from situation to situation to situation. So that is why we're tempted in physiognomy to look precisely to these kinds of features. So he goes on and he says, these lineaments and their movements are according to this notion the action which is held back. So in acting, 
part of what's being done is what we've already talked about before, the, you know, the movement into the outer, the, the, as he's going to say, expression, right? But part of it is being held back. Held back for what? Held back for the inner of the individual. Sort of, you know, continually retained. Um, now he goes on and he says something really interesting here. He says, um, this remains in the individual. And as regards the individual's relation to the action really performed, they constitute his own control and observation of the action. So up until now, we've really been talking about the, the outer, the external action as being something that is sort of thrown out there. And it's supposed to express the individual more than anything else. But we saw that there were some problems and some paradoxes with that. Now we see, uh, you, you might call it a, a restoration of, of a kind of initiative that has been there the entire time. The, the individual is able to engage in reflection, or as Hegel says, control, over the external action. Now, what does that mean? Well, Hegel calls this another kind of expression. So really, we have expression occurring in two different ways. And he's going to go on further and talk about it as also being a kind of action. Let's look at this, this paragraph very uh, closely. He says, what we have here is expression in the sense of a reflection on the actual, the expression that, that has been externalized. So there's an expression that is external, and then there's also an expression that is internal. And all of this is occurring precisely because of the capacity for this middle term to be reappropriated into the interiority of the person. That's what allows them to have this capacity for engaging in a kind of control over the action. We might think of this in terms of, well, if we use the example of the face, right? When you do an action, you can signify to other people, for example, that you're doing it under duress, that it's not reflective of who you are, or that you're really anticipating the result of the action. And we, we might, might multiply uh, examples uh, of this sort of thing. So he says, the individual is not dumb as regards his external action because he is thereby at once reflected into himself and gives expression to this reflectedness into self. Now Hegel, towards the end of this, talks about this theoretical action or the individual's speech with himself about the external action. Thinking is a kind of communication within the self. We're not just having pure thought. In a certain way, you can say that um, there's, a, there's a primacy uh, that, that is not entirely complete within Hegel, but, but emerges from time to time. A primacy of the practical over the merely speculative, the merely theoretical. What is it to, to be? It is to act. It's not just to think, it's to act. Because thought itself is a kind of action. Something that um, was recognized, but, but was not fully worked out by previous thinkers like, say, Aristotle or Thomas Aquinas. And so this thinking to oneself about one's own actions and its externalities, its expression, is itself a, a kind of action within oneself. And here's where it gets really interesting. Hegel says that this can be manifested to an other. He says, this theoretical action is perceptible to others, for this speech is itself an expression. What speech? The interior speech of thought. So already we have the other being brought back into the picture in an important way. In this inner, therefore, which in its expression remains an inner, there is observed the individual as reflected out of his actual being. 
and we have to see what is the significance of this necessity which is posited in this unity. This reflectedness is in the first place different from the deed itself and therefore can be something other than the deed and can be taken for something other. We see from a man's face whether he is in earnest about what he is saying or doing. Conversely, however, what is here supposed to be the expression of the inner is at the same time an expression in the form of immediate being, and hence is itself degraded to the level of mere being, which is absolutely contingent for the self-conscious being. It is therefore indeed an expression, but at the same time only in the sense of a sign so that the particular way in which the content is expressed is a matter of complete indifference so far as the content itself is concerned. In this appearance, the inner is no doubt a visible invisible, but it is not tied to this appearance. It can be manifested just as well in another way, just as another inner can be manifested in the same appearance. Lichtenberg therefore rightly says, suppose the physiognomist ever did take the measure of a man. It would only require a courageous resolve on the part of the man to make himself incomprehensible again for a thousand years. Just as in the previous relationship, the given circumstances were a passive being from which the individuality took what it could and wanted, either submitting to or transforming that being, for which reason it did not contain the necessity and essential nature of the individuality, so here the manifest immediate being of the individuality is one which either expresses the fact of its being reflected out of its actual existence and its being within itself, or which is for the individuality merely a sign indifferent to what is signified, therefore truly signifying nothing. For the individuality, it is as much its countenance as its mask which it can lay aside. The, the individuality permeates its shape, moves, and speaks in it. But this existence in its entirety equally turns into a being that is indifferent to the will and the deed. Individuality effaces from it the significance it formerly had, that is, of being that in which the individuality is reflected into itself or has its true essence. Instead, it places its essence rather in the will and the deed. Paragraph 318 is quite long and is a very important transition point away from some of these reflections that Hegel has been engaging in about the human being and his or her action as a, a sign of, of who, what you know, that person really is, as opposed to, say, the things that palmistry is going to look at or physiognomy. And he's moving towards now letting physiognomy have its say, at least briefly. Although you notice that in the middle of this, uh, the middle of this, this paragraph, he's got this passage from Lichtenberg, who he, he's going to quote several times in this, um, this entire section, uh, who is an earlier critic of, of physiognomy and all the pretensions that were going along with it. Hegel himself is, is very deeply critical of it, but he thinks that there's an important set of, you might say, negative lessons that are being learned along the way. So let's, let's look at what he says. He says, in this inner, right, we're talking about the relation to the inner, the outer, which in its expression remains an inner, there's this interiority, right? Uh, there is observed, but obacted, right? Remember, this is the section observing reason. So we're talking about reason engaging in some observation of itself, of the conscious person, and presumably um, extrapolating from this to how it must be for, for other people as well. We're talking about subjectivity observing itself at this point. So he says, um, the, the individual is observed as reflected out of his actual being, his Wirklichkeit, um, his how he is within the world, the world of, of others, the world as it presents itself, the world of appearance, if we like that. Um, there is something lying behind the appearances uh, that is an individuality, that is subjective, that, that has this, this uh, intentional relationship with itself in its externalizations. And so Hegel will talk in terms of, uh, he'll use terms like reflectedness, 
But he's also talked about reflection as a sort of attitude or activity. Um, expression as well, right? In the last paragraph, we saw that this process of, of thinking about oneself or taking a stance towards oneself, a reflexive attitude, is carried out as a kind of expression. It is an action, and as an action, it becomes, he actually said, something observable from the outside by somebody else. So now we're seeing the upshot of this. It says, we have to see what is the significance of this necessity which is posited in this unity. Now, notice he's saying this necessity is posited. He's not saying that the necessity really is there at this point, but it's something that we have assumed, and now we want to see, well, what's going on with that? So he goes on and he says, um, this reflectedness is in the first place different from the deed. And Hegel is going to change his terminology in a way that Miller's translation doesn't fully capture along the way because Miller is using this term deed to cover both tat, which it, it works for, and also handlung, um, which it also works for, right? So it's not, it's not a terrible error, but there, there is a kind of movement within the, the passage. So he says, um, the reflectiveness is different than the deed, itself, the externalized action, and can be taken for something other. Now, when we're looking from the outside at a person who's doing something, we don't just see the doing itself, or if we're thinking in terms of speech or writing, uh, we don't just see that itself. Now, writing is a little bit different because that can be done at a distance, right? So let's put that one off for, for, for the moment. Just speech and, and, and the work of the hands, right? Handlung. So we see that, but we also see the person. And we assume that there is a kind of what we're, we're going to call motivatedness. And I'll talk about what that means in just, just a moment. A motivatedness to what they're, they're doing. The thing that they're doing is significative because they're not just doing it purely at random. Or if they are doing something purely at random, like just walking around and whistling, presumably even that is significative of relaxing or something along those lines, right? So you can't really get away from signification. It doesn't necessarily mean every assumption about the signification is actually right, but it, we are in a world that, that does have meaningful action. All right, so let's go on from there. He says, um, we see from a man's face whether he is in earnest about what he is saying or doing. This is an important observation. We see in a person's face whether they are in earnest, ernst, about what they're saying or doing. Or at least we think that we do, right? That's why we are so subject to being um, taken in and sometimes manipulated because um, sometimes we mistake these things or sometimes people are actually fooling us. Hegel is going to talk later in this passage about the difference between the face itself and a mask that is covering it up and the fact that the, the human face can in fact become a mask. And uh, this is a little bit of a digression but this is not something that is totally unique to human beings. As a matter of fact, um, we see this running throughout the animal kingdom, the pretense to be something other than what one is or to dispose of, of one's body in ways that, that convey a message different than what one um, really means, right? So territorial fights where the, the, the two sparring, or in terms of mating, right, um, don't actually try to hurt each other, even though they could very easily. Think about bucks and their antlers clashing them together. It would be a lot more rational if they wanted to get rid of the competition, just gore them, right? Like a bull gores somebody, but they don't do that. Instead, they smack these together and they do that thing. And we could go on and on and on. You can think about other animals that are particularly good at uh, mimicry and manipulation of their environment, like what the most intelligent, uh, intelligent of invertebrates, the octopus, and we can go on and on and on. 
So is, this isn't a purely human trait, but you've got to admit that human beings have done it for so long that it, it makes uh, human interactions much more problematic in the way that Hegel's talking about here. We look at a person and we can tell whether they're earnest about what they're saying. Maybe they really mean it, they have a serious expression, um, they're saying something angry, they look angry, they're saying something sad, they actually look sad, or perhaps they say something and they're joking around with us. You know? And if we think about um, the way a lot of our recent comedy actually works, much of it plays off of, and this is sort of a trait that runs through uh, comedy, at least in the 20th and, and 21st century, plays off of that, that disjunction, that slippage, saying something horrible in a very upbeat uh, tone of voice with a smile on your face, or uh, doing the, the, the converse, right? The, that incongruity is a possibility for us. And the question here then is, well, should the face be taken as something purely external? No, because it, it comes with you, right? It tells you whether the deed, the saying, the doing, is really earnest or not. So it's really uh, an expression of this inner, even though it is something outer. He goes on and he says, conversely, what is here supposed to be the expression of the inner is at the same time an expression in the form of immediate being. That is, the face just is, and it is a certain way. Like mine right now, right? Smiling, big smile. Why am I doing this? I'm just doing it to illustrate a point. It's not the same thing as smiling that way, um, which, you know, now that I think about it, it actually kind of hurts the cheeks a little bit when you're totally, you know, losing it laughing at, at something or thinking a funny thought. So he goes on and he says, um, it's degraded to the level of mere being, which is absolutely contingent for the self-conscious being. Here's where that, that notion of motivation comes in. But let me read one more uh, sentence, and then we'll bring that in. He says, it's therefore indeed an expression, but at the same time only in the sense of a sign, so that the particular way in which the content is expressed is a matter of complete indifference so far as the content itself is concerned. The face, the expression, is a sign. And for Hegel, when we see this term sign, he means an arbitrary, conventional, and therefore contingent sign that could be um, a matter of chance, a matter of caprice. It could be a matter of deliberate deception. It could be a matter of um, mistaking what the person is actually showing us. In any case, we have the possibility of earnestness or what we could call the motivated sign, right? When the face is showing something that we take to be uh, true of, of the intentionality inhabiting it, the, then it is motivated. And when not, then it is purely arbitrary. Now the problem is, we can't always decide which is which. Sometimes we can't even do this with ourselves. You know, people who have uh, a long history of lying to themselves or concealing from themselves things that they don't want to face up to, they're in a position towards themselves of the other. Some people are forced into uh, conditions where they have to dissimulate. You know, think about this. If you don't smile, you're not going to keep your job. In a, in a situation where jobs are hard to find, you smile, right? Because you need to keep that job. And what does that smile mean? Well, that's just an arbitrary sign in this, court, in this case. Because you wouldn't keep on smiling like that if you didn't need the job. Except that at a certain point, you may in fact keep smiling like that. Or you might be doing that just to, you, know, you son of a bitch, boss, I hate your guts, right? What was that you said? Eh, just talking about how much I love it here. You know, we could go on and on, and on with examples like that. You see that the, the possibility of really showing what is in the inner is rather attenuated, isn't it? By the very fact of how expressive our face can be.
or our voice or our hands that are engaging in actions. So he says, in this appearance, the inner is no doubt a visible invisible. This is what I had mentioned several paragraphs before, that we were going to see the visible become the, the invisible becoming visible, and Hegel talk about a visible invisible. And then he says, but it's not tied to this appearance. What's the invisible? The inner is invisible. You can't see my soul. You can't see my personality. You can certainly do inventories if you like, if you're a psychologist, but uh, those don't tell you a hell of a lot when when you really get down to it because people, as soon as they figure out what's going on, they give you data that's rather conflicting. Um, Sometimes they're useful. uh, Quite often for for many people, they're, they're not these days. But in any case, he says... Um, It can be manifested just as well as in another way, just as another inner can be manifested in the same appearance. And here's where he gets to Lichtenberg's statement. Now, this is a brilliant thing that Lichtenberg, who if you haven't read before, you should should read him. He he is well worth reading. He uh, often is read by people only because of references to him by other philosophers, but he's well worth reading for his own sake. He says, suppose the physiognomist ever did take the measure of a man. It would only require a courageous resolve on the part of the man to make, him in, make himself incomprehensible again for a thousand years. Physiognomy is supposed to be looking at the face or the frame of the body and deducing how the person really is, what's going on inside of them, from, from the outward uh, appearance and then you know, correlating that to what they in fact do. So the physiognomist might think that there is a um, frame of, of the body that, that shows along with a certain facial cast that this person is dangerous, whereas this person is friendly. Um, and Lichtenberg is pointing out, well, you know, let's say that, that somebody actually does come up with this. And let's say that for, for a moment it's actually true. As soon as a human being finds out that you're doing this sort of uh, rule, uh, rule uh, deducing, this, they, they see it as you trying to regulate them. And they say, screw you. I'm not going to do what you want me to do. I'm not going to conform to those rules. I'm going to be something different. And then the law-like regularity is no longer regularity, is it? Things become contingent. The mere fact that human beings can do that means that the whole enterprise is really doomed from the start, isn't it? So he says, just as in the previous relationship, and what does he mean by this? The previous relationship was that in the previous section, the given circumstances were a passive being from which individuality took what it could and wanted, right? The the things that were supposed to be determining us, psychological laws or logical laws, we got to pick and choose what we allowed to affect us. He says, Um, uh, for which reason it did not contain the necessity and essential nature of the individuality. So here, the manifest immediate being of the individuality is one which either expresses the fact of its being reflected out of its actual existence, right, the Wirklichkeit, and the reflection out of that into something inner, which is there to begin with, uh, and its being within itself, or for which, or, or which is for the individuality merely a sign indifferent to what is signified. What's supposed to be signified by the sign? It's not the action, right? The sign is supposed to be signifying what is going on inside of us. The smile is supposed to signify happiness, but it could also signify hatred, or it could signify compliance. The you know pensive frowning face is supposed to convey who who knows what sadness, uh, being a deep person, um, being shallow perhaps you know when it's uh, because your your ice cream fell on the ground when you're an adult you know when you're a kid and your ice cream falls out that's a tragedy. When it falls out as an adult, well, that's just a mishap. <laughs> so you shouldn't be so quite so upset about that. Um, anger. You know, some people, it's quite interesting. I'll give you a prime example from my own experience. I used to be very bothered 
by the fact that when I would get angry, and I struggled with anger a lot, um, one of the things that would happen to me was my you know, adrenaline response would kick in and my hands would shake, right? And I thought, well, that's no good, right? Because people see your hands shaking and they're going to assume that you're actually afraid and then um, you're probably going to have to fight them or, or you know, it's going to be harder to deal with things. Or if you are getting angry and you want them to take seriously the fact that you're, you're done putting up with their nonsense, having shaking hands is not going to help you with that. Turns out that's not actually the case. There are so many different ways that you can tell whether somebody really is angry or not that um, that's, that's, that's not that big of an issue. And, but that, that was uh, something that, that I thought. Now the shaking hands, what does it signify? It, it, it's a sign, right? What interior disposition does it show? Well, in order to understand that, we probably can't just go by those signs. We're going to have to look at the outward and what happens and what comes out of the individuality. So he says, um, here's where we get to this really brilliant part about masks. He says, therefore truly signifying nothing, right? For the individuality, it is as much its countenance, its face, as its mask, which it can lay aside. The face is a mask. But the mask is a face. How do you tell the difference? Well, he goes on and he says, the individuality permeates its shape, its frame. It moves and speaks in it. But this existence in its entirety equally turns into a being that is indifferent to the will and the deed. And now here he doesn't just talk about the deed or the doing or the behavior. He talks about willing, das Willen. Right, And this doesn't mean the faculty of will. That would be something interior, right? This is what is actually chosen or the act of choosing as opposed to, say, the capacity or the faculty of choice residing in, in there. This, the, the faculty of choice you can't really see. You can maybe deduce some things about it by what a person does. Um, you can know about your own faculty of choice, I suppose, to some degree. But we can tell what a person does, in fact, will by seeing what, what they actually do, what they choose, what they prefer, and what they uh, give a lower priority to. That shows us this, what Hegel's calling here, the, the will. So he, he says, um, individuality effaces from it the significance it formerly had of being that in which the individuality is reflected into itself or has its true essence. Instead, it places its essence rather in the will and the deed, in what is external. Now we're actually set up to start doing some physiognomy, or at least thinking about what it might be like to do some physiognomy, 